We begin at four with breaking news in Westwood. Protesters out there blocking traffic. Stu Mundell and Sky Nine are live over the scene. Stu. Well, and Sandra, it's basically a very peaceful uh, protest, but as you just mentioned, it is blocking a lot of streets out here. This is going to be the intersection of Wilshire and Westwood. You can see LAPD out there right now taking some of these folks in custody. They had a set of, at a ring out there in the middle of the intersection. LAPD shutting down several blocks of Wilshire Boulevard to keep these protesters safe. Now, these protesters are from the University of California. UC protesters are what they're calling themselves, and they're out here... To, protesting what they're saying is racial uh, disparities between the uh, employees that are working on the at the campus. Now, these aren't just the union workers out here. They're actually being joined by a lot of other folk and also students this afternoon. Right now, LAPD bringing this peaceful uh, protest pretty much to an end as they're taking a group of people into custody out here. All the other folks have been on the sidewalks and obeying the laws. But while this is going on, a good portion of Wilshire Boulevard at Westwood will be closed. Live in Sky 9, I'm Stu Mandel. Back to you two in the studio. There was nothing by her body language, her, her conversation, her uh, demeanor, or the information that we, rece we received from the family that suggested that we should handle this in any other manner in which the officers handled it. Mountain View police say they had no warning a woman was going to become violent and fire a gun at YouTube headquarters. But the shooter's family has a different story. Hello, everyone. I'm Juan Fernandez. Good afternoon. I'm Sandra Mitchell. And today for Lena Wynn. So the questions, mm -hmm. who knew what and when? Those are the two big questions that investigators are trying to answer now about the shooting at YouTube headquarters. The shooter's family say they warned police of her possible intentions around 2 a.m. yesterday morning, hours before she opened fire on the YouTube campus, a claim Mountain View police firmly deny. The shooter's family says she was upset with YouTube about the way the company treated her. We have live team coverage of the investigation of the shooting. KKL 9's Randy Page is in Menifee, where he is talking to friends and family of the shooter. But first, Tom Waite is at the scene in San Bruno with some new information for us. Tom. And Juan, we are learning some new chilling details, really, at what the shooter was doing in the hours leading up to the shooting here at the YouTube headquarters in San Bruno. Here's what we can tell you at this point. It's still locked down here. Police are still here trying to gather clues and trying to piece this all together. At YouTube's San Bruno campus, a stream of staffers trickled back into the building a day after a woman opened fire here. Police remained at the complex and crime tape sealed off the area. Meanwhile, police revealed new details about the shooter, 39-year-old Nassim Ogdam, and what she was doing in the hours before her rampage. Ogdam was apparently doing some target practice at a range nearby. She was at the, uh, the, the gun range early uh, the morning of the incident. Police have not identified the gun range, but law enforcement officers were seen entering the Jackson Arms Range in South San Francisco this morning. A witness there reported seeing someone they thought was Ogdom yesterday before the shooting. We've also learned from Mountain View Police that they found Ogdom sleeping in her car just after 1 a.m. yesterday morning. Mountain View is about 35 miles from the YouTube San Bruno campus. Mountain View officers located Ogdom after her family reported her missing and in that area. Mountain View police say they were told by Ogdam's father she was upset about YouTube restricting her video content, but said her father never reported she may be violent or armed. She was not detained. There was nothing by her body language, her, her conversation, her uh, demeanor, or the information that we received from the family that suggested that we should handle this in any other manner in which the officers handled it. As for motive, San Bruno police say Ogdam was likely targeting YouTube because she was angry over those restrictions on the videos she posted. It is believed that the suspect was upset with policies and practices of YouTube. Forensic investigators are combing through her website and social media accounts for more clues. Online, she ranted against YouTube for how they treated her. I'm being discriminated and filtered on YouTube. We also learned today from investigators that Ogdam likely entered the YouTube campus from a parking garage around lunchtime, then started shooting at her victims before taking her own life. 
Sam Bruno, investigators right now are telling us there is no known connection between the shooter and her victims. They also say they received no heads up that this woman may be targeting the YouTube campus here in San Bruno. As for the victims, two of the three victims have been released from the hospital. There are two women. They have not been identified yet. A third man remains hospitalized, but his condition has been upgraded from critical to serious. Reporting live in San Bruno, I'm Tom Waite. Back to you guys in the studio. All right, Tom, thanks so much. The shooter's family lives in the Riverside County community of Menifee, and they're expressing sorrow about what happened, but they're also saying they warned police. KCAL 9's Randy Page continues our team coverage with that part of the story. Randy? Well, Juan, the Ogden family's asked for privacy, so we are honoring that request. We moved across the street. But as what you can well imagine, this Iranian family is devastated. I'm sorry. I can't believe it. Nassim Agdam's father, Ismail, emerged from his home this afternoon only long enough to hand out this written statement, which says, in part, our family is in absolute shock and can't make sense of what has happened yesterday. Although no words can describe our deep pain for this tragedy, our family would like to express their utmost regret, sorry for what has happened to innocent victims. Her family tells us 38-year-old Nassim Agdam came to the United States when she was 18 as a refugee from Iran. They say she was an animal rights activist and vegan. Her YouTube videos show her passion for exercise and activism. She was known as Green Nassim by thousands of followers. Her family says about a year ago, Nassim became very angry when YouTube censored her videos, as Nassim herself explained online. I'm being discriminated and filtered on YouTube, and I'm not the only one. This woman, who told us she was Nassim's aunt but would not give her name, described Nassim's online crusade in this way. Stop eating animals. And YouTube filtered her videos. That way that happened, and I'm so sorry. I feel so bad for the, those people shot. Hopefully they've been alive. And she's, so she's angry at YouTube? Yeah, and because you, they feel terror. I'm so sorry. Members of Nassim Agdam's family say the 38-year-old activist had been living with her grandmother in this home in San Diego, which authorities searched today. Ismail told us he warned police that his daughter was angry at YouTube and there could be trouble. So for one year she was angry at YouTube and police said they would watch her in Mountain yeah, View. Yeah, but they didn't. Another aunt told us Nassim was not a violent person. They had no idea she owned a gun or that a tragedy like this could happen. Feeling so bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm feeling down. Well, well, I'm feeling so sad for What's the family going through? They're so sad. Did you have any idea she was had this potential to do this? Uh, no, I have any idea. Was she a loving person? Yes, of course. Now, the Ogden family is really beloved in this community. We should point out when we first arrived, our crews here last night, all the way through today, members of the neighborhood have been extremely concerned and upset about the huge media presence here, honking, sometimes swearing at us, really angry that we are here. Uh, but we are definitely moving as far away from the home as we can to give them privacy. We understand that this is a, dev a devastated family that is a victim, and they are victims here as well. Let's go back to you. All right. Randy, thank you. Of course, we're gathering information in Northern California and here in our area, and we're going to bring you updates as soon as we get new details. As always, you can get the latest on our website, kcal9.com. Sending U.S. troops to the border with Mexico, the Trump administration is working with governors to immediately deploy the National Guard. The president has directed that the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security work together with our governors to deploy the National Guard to our southwest border to assist the Border Patrol. The president will be signing a proclamation to that effect today. The Secretary of Homeland Security is saying the first troops could be sent tonight. The president announced his plan yesterday during a meeting with Baltic leaders. Mr. Trump says he's frustrated by Congress's refusal to fund a border wall. He also is concerned about a recent report of a caravan from Honduras headed to the border. Governor Jerry Brown has not commented. The National Guard says this request will be promptly reviewed to determine how best we can assist our federal partners. We look forward to more detail, including funding, duration, and end state. Also at four, the U.S. and China are one step closer to a trade war. 
the Trump administration announced $50 billion in tariffs against that country, and now China is fighting back. KCAL 9's Weijia Jiang has the latest from the White House. The markets plunged as soon as they opened amid fears the U.S. and China are heading into a trade war before recovering in the afternoon. China announced overnight it is putting a 25 percent tariff on 106 U.S. made products, including soybeans, beef, cars and some aircraft. It's a direct response to the tariffs the U.S. put on about 1,300 Chinese products. We've not done this and we should have for years. So if there's some short-term volatility, uh, I believe it's going to be worth it. The Trump administration pointed out the U.S. already has a $500 billion deficit with China. When you're $500 billion down, this isn't a war you can lose if it gets to be a war. And President Trump tweeted this morning, we are not in a trade war with China. That war was lost many years ago by the foolish or incompetent people who represented the U.S. The U.S. and Chinese tariffs will not take effect immediately. China says if and when it begins imposing the penalties depends on the outcome of negotiations between the two countries. It'll be a couple months before tariffs on either side uh, would go into effect and be implemented. And we're hopeful that China will do the right thing. China is America's largest soybean export market. We have to export. We can't eat anymore here in the United States. Agriculture survives based on exports, and if we lose that opportunity, it's going to be a deep problem for agriculture and rural communities. The soybean harvest is still about six months away. Weijia Jiang at the White House. was a sound minutes ago. Bells tolled at places of worship around the nation at the exact same time of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. The bells tolled 39 times, one for each year he spent on earth. Dr. King was killed 50 years ago today, but as Mark Strassman shows us, his legacy and his message live on. A half century to the day since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Memphis led America looking back. And I've seen the promised land. But also looking forward. Dr. King's dream lives within you, within us. Dr. King was cut down here in Memphis as he stood on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. Today, that building is part of the National Civil Rights Museum, host of the commemoration, attracting thousands of visitors like Marjorie Kennard. It's sort of like going to Mecca. That, that's the experience I have, coming to Mecca, where people from all over the country are here. All over the country, Americans mark the 50-year milestone with marches and ceremonies, from Atlanta, where Dr. King was laid to rest, to the MLK Memorial in Washington. And in Indianapolis, where Robert F. Kennedy first announced the assassination. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Civil rights icon John Lewis was there that night and returned for the anniversary. The handman from Martin Luther King Jr., I don't know what would have happened to our nation. I don't know what would have happened to many of us. Dr. King was 39 when he was murdered. This remembrance was designed to honor the movement he led and to remind America of his unfinished vision. Mark Strassman, Memphis. And coming up at 4.30, we'll have local reaction and remembrances as people from coast to coast honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 50 years after his assassination. Two people are dead after a shooting in Long Beach and one of the victims survived the killing fields in Cambodia but was killed in his backyard. Plus, we have new details on the settlements paid by former Fox News host Bill O'Reilly. Those are being made public now. Also, Facebook releasing some new information about their massive data breach. Amber. And a live look right now, Sky 9 over Beverly Hills, where you can see the fog is slowly creeping in. I'll have more details on our rain chances coming up.